Now for Global Business Updates, Bosin Omofaye joins us. Good morning, Bosin. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a Monday morning, but my closest neighbor. Boring. Okay. <laughs> good, good morning. Uh, take a look. <laughs> and to the uh, General Simo. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. How are you? And good everyone. Let's be a look at a week in the United States to the release of September CPI report. The FOMC, that's the Federal Open Market Committee meeting. Minutes at the start of the earnings season are the forefront. That's what you're looking at the dashboard. Monday, Tuesday, a little bit heavy. Then you get to Wednesday and Thursday, looking a lot heavier. The U.S. Uh, FOMC meeting, that's the last September uh, meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee. Then you have Thursday with the U.S. inflation and the ECB monetary policy minutes. And then you have Friday, it's a TGI of UK first quarter GDP as well as US PPI inflation. That's producer price inflation. Uh, take your pick. Let's continue the rest of the week. Oil prices, let's move on. Paired gains on early trade Monday after charting their biggest weekly rise over a year on Friday amid mounting threats of a region wide war in the Middle East. Brent crude fell 0.37% to $77.76 per barrel by around 6.37 GMT. The U.S. West Texas intermediate slipped 0.23% to $74.21 per barrel. In Asia, Pacific markets mostly climbed on Monday, led by Japan's decay 2 to 5, rising almost 2% as investors look ahead to a week of central bank decisions from around the region. The Nikkei climbed 1.8%, powered by financials and consumer cyclical stocks, and closed at 39,332.7. Australia's ES S&P ESX 200 rose 0.68% and closed at 8,205. However, the Hong Kong Hang Seng Index climbed 1.09%, while mainland China's markets remain closed for the Golden Week holiday and will return to trade on Tuesday. Now, the World Investor Week 2024, a week-long global campaign by the International Organization of Securities Commission, or IOSCO, and the World Federation of Exchanges kick off today, Monday, the 7th of October. This year's World Investor Week it looks to disseminate key messages that support investor education, investor protection, and financial literacy, as well as foster learning opportunities for investors. The principal themes for this year's World Investor Week include technology and digital finance, crypto assets, and sustainable finance, which will be complemented with discussions and workshops on fraud and scam prevention, investor resilience, and the basics of investing. Nigeria's debt servicing payments have surged nearly 70% in the first half of this year, reaching 6.04 trillion naira, and that's up from 3.58 trillion naira recorded in the same period of last year. The sharp rise in debt service obligations, likely driven by naira devaluation for foreign debt repayments, reflects the growing burden on the federal government as debt repayment consumes a significant portion of its financial resources. According to data from the latest statistical bulletin of the Central Bank of Nigeria, debt service between January and June this year made up 50% of the total expenditure of $12.17 trillion and a staggering 162% of the $3.73 trillion total revenue generated during the period under review. So a former president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, Okechuku Nebu, has asked bank customers in Nigeria to approach the courts if they observe irregular deductions from their accounts. Unebu, who is also a former managing director of the defunct Citizens International Bank, gave the advice in an interview with the news agency of Nigeria over the weekend in Abuja. He spoke against the backdrop of complaints by bank customers on unexplained multiple deductions from their accounts. To you, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, those deductions <laughs> are there. Good one. Gentlemen and ladies. And ladies. Yeah, yes, it's, 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 it's hey, a double. There are no ladies double. in the media. I think they also oh, say gentlemen, gentlemen of, the, of press. the press. Lady and, no, I'm fighting that. We're bringing back the lady into the lady and gentleman. So gentlemen those, of the press. Those deductions, very, very, very painful stuff. And I've seen people go through that. I think the idea of going to the court individually mm. is going to be problematic because of the legal encumbrances. Mm. So can we have a class action suit? Yeah, you can have. And I think that's that regards some... those deductions because you see them by the banks and they perpetrate this very nefarious evil mm. with it. They get into your account, chuck your money out, you don't get anything in the end. And I've heard people call me and say, you know what, I'm in court with this bank as regards X, Y, Z amount of deduction. Also, cyber crime going on in banking accounts that the banks I have not been able to, and there are some banks that are corporates that have not made major investment as regards their online banking platforms. Mm. There was a bank particularly last week that had no network for a whole week. And that's one of the biggest banks in this country. Mm. And it's a shame. 
One of the top three. Can you imagine that? And this well, bank records a lot of humongous profits. So we need to do something about it. And I quickly want to also go to the story. That's why we kept on making the case for, it's not a sensible idea, the devaluation of the currency. And I've seen Mr. Cardoso try to argue over the case of the fair value of the Naira, and this was the best way forward. That was not the best way forward. Because I've constantly argued, for those that support the devaluation, that if you look at the economic loss that has accrued to the Nigerian economy since this devaluation, it is more than the money you will have spent in defending the currency. It is yeah, way more. Mm. Is it business so, loss? Is it enterprise loss? Mm. Is it the effect of small businesses? Mm. Is this business shutdown? Is it the effect of the economy? It is way more than the amount that the 15, 16 billion you will have spent on defending the currency. Because now, you are still defending the currency. The former minister of finance told you we're going to find a fair value of Naira at 700. It's not happened. We are still defending the currency. A couple of weeks ago, we expended over $500 million to defend the currency. And today, we are still pegged at 1,600 or 1,700. Interesting scenario we have there. But I think one of the things with the bank deductions, very quickly, was about the, the central bank has a window in which bank customers who suffer whatever type of um, illegal deductions, deductions or whatever in the, bank is, uh, in the banking system can call or make a, uh, send a text message or send an email. Yeah. I think that is... There's the, a dedicated email. I was trying to look for that. Yes. Where if you can, if you, when you email your bank mm -hmm. with regards to um, unauthorized charges and mm -hmm. copy, they, yeah. are, they, are, they would probably act faster because there's a, there's a CBN desk that is actually in charge of that. Yeah, dedicated and the, and to the that. banks would be fined. But the truth is, and I want to talk about that this morning, Mr. Onoibu was speaking the hearts and minds of many Nigerians. Um, we're talking about financial inclusion. We're tr talking about getting more unbanked people to trust the banking system to bring their money in. And one of these, this charges are one of the things that, is it, that, that, that act as a deterrent to actually having that happen. And then, of course, the technological challenges that we also have in the banking system in recent times. How can you, based on trust, having put your money in an account, not be able to have access to that? It puts a lot of people in, 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 in trouble, yeah. at stressful position all through yeah. last week. Mm. And it would be interesting to see what the CBN's response to that would be. Yes, there have been apologies, but for some people, apologies wouldn't quite cut it. And yeah. until we start to have stiffer penalties. Yeah. Illegal deductions. Yes, one thing. stiffer penalties. Uh, excess charges. Maybe if you give us back, maybe uh, um, credit money everybody's, without, uh, everybody's money. And then that, that brings me to a conversation I want to talk about this morning on AI yeah. and um, how, in terms of our technology and investment in technology and AI, yesterday I went for a, you know, a high level conversation, especially for philanthropists, around um, Nigeria's risk of being AI excluded and the importance of this and how the rest of the world has gone a lot further. I bring it up because whenever we talk about AI, they're like, oh, we have more problems. Let's fix our power issues. And I mean, I think I've even expressed that as well, that let's, so we have fun, fundamental infrastructural issues in Nigeria that needs to be dealt with. But the truth has also been said that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. We are being left behind. The world is moving fast. Some of the challenges that we have, whether in education, in banking, health sector, in security, can mm. really be sorted or helped, you know, using AI. So we're just bringing business leaders to begin to think about this new, you know, begin to invest in this, begin to invest in organizations. Mm. That is the future. And I just think for me now, let me become yeah. an advocate because Nigeria cannot afford to be AI excluded, whether as a nation but, or in different but, parts but, of the like world. Said, well, last week, uh, last Friday, <laughs> I was talking about uh, U.S. Uh, payroll's uh, numbers coming in. Mm. 159,000 was declared in August. Now, we had a jumbo report on Friday, 254,000. And that, according to the analysts, is an indication that the U.S. economy remains very strong and that uh, you know, there's no fear of recession and that we're likely to have a situation in November, or in, uh, November whereby you know, the Federal Reserve would uh, you know, cut more. And people are saying perhaps the, cut, uh, the last uh, cut in rates should have been up to a hundred, a, a half point, 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 a fifty percent percentage point. But in any case, it looks like the U.S. economy is in a good place. Mm. In terms of what is up next this week, we're expecting the consumer price index uh, for September, September yes. and also the uh, producer the factory, price mm, index. Factory index yes. yes, but those are not, you know, the key things that uh, the Federal Reserve 
looks at to make uh, Jobs is key. his decision. As to oil that you talked about, well, oil is volatile. Now, I think Brent crude is up to about $78 uh, per barrel. But the situation is that if you have uh, an escalation of the crisis in the Middle East and you have the Strait of Hormuz close down, we may well find ourselves, you know, in terms of the projection, that oil price could go up to $200 per barrel. But as I said, the main issue is about the spec capacity that the Gulf states have. Mm -hmm. If that is threatened, then, of course, we'll be in a situation where, mm -hmm. you know, oil prices will go up, uh, out of the roof, yes. and then there will be implications for consumer, for consumptions, uh, for uh, you know, especially for, for, for uh, especially for importers, but, for importing yeah, countries. Yeah. But I think okay. that this morning it looks like President Biden has been able to to temper things with Israel, and 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 that the attack or well, retaliatory attack hasn't yeah. really come in. That remains to I be think seen. That, that's why oil prices are beginning to decelerate slightly because the fears before the weekend have been a lot more heightened. But you never can tell what Benjamin Netanyahu will do. Well, it, you know, or, all that uh, global politics, geopolitics. There's a lot of hypocrisy there. So we can't say this will happen with certainty. But oil prices will remain volatile. We can be sure yeah, of that. that one. Now, beyond that, Nigeria, you were talking about, you know, debt, you know, servicing going up. I thought uh, uh, Patience Sunia, the DMO uh, director general, she's still there. Yes, she's still. She used to say, whoa, we, the debt uh, burden of Nigeria is sustainable. We are deploying strategies and economic tools to make sure that, uh, you know, the debt uh, uh, range is sustainable and that, in fact, we are not owing enough. We have not borrowed enough. We can still borrow more. So what are they saying now about this uh, so-called debt uh, sustainability now that you say Nigeria is losing revenue uh, servicing debts? What happened to those economic tools and strategies? Devaluation happened. There were a lot of things happened on the way to heaven. That's just it. So, <laughs> so the tools and strategies don't work again. It's devaluation. Yeah, it's about to, it's it's devaluation. You're spending but, but but it's, to chase dollars. But it's, yes, I think we're still much of work in progress. Well, but the GMO mm -hmm. office is the office that has the responsibility to find creative ways to manage Nigeria's hey, sovereign debt. Management, that. management office, doctor. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I hope these people know their job. I hope they know what they're doing. Anyway, thank you very much. Both